Good evening and welcome to our second keynote address. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to have Professor Raji Steinek here tonight for the keynote. And maybe instead of giving a length, lengthy um, introduction, I would first of all like to thank you for your continuous support this year, last year, and especially in the early days when ENOGP just began to take shape and we were just a bunch of PhD students. Um, it was a great help when he gave us his positive answer. And that was very, very rare in the uh, German-speaking countries at that time. <clears throat> so thank you for that. And now maybe a little um, information. Um, the, you published the book Kritik der Symbolischen Formen, first part. And the second part will be um, um, yeah, will be published next year in end of next year. No, we wait. Yeah, June, in June, 2016 is all the publishers sense. Okay, yeah, we are looking forward to that. <laughs> and I think now um, we start. Yeah. So. Um, Well, thank you, Gerrit, for this kind introduction and to you all for inviting me and having me here as a keynote speaker. I'm very honored. And a special thanks goes to Paulus Kaufmann, who is here attending in spite of the fact that today is his birthday. It's <laughs> a special honor. Thank you. Usually when people give keynote addresses, they give keynote addresses because they have a lot of achievements and they look back on what they've done. Uh, this is not what I'm going to do today for various reasons. Um, what I want to do is I want to invite you to join me on an ongoing thought process. concerning the limits of nature and reification and its discontents. I will start out by sharing with you um, the irritations that got this thought process started in my case. Um, and then in a second part, I will present thoughts by two Japanese philosophers, Hiromatsu Wataru and Maki Yusuke, that can help us think about nature and reification. Um, then, following the Kisho Tenketsu mode, in the ten part, I will turn to Marxian theory of value and consider its possible implications for the problem of nature. And finally, uh, to sum up, I will give some qualifications uh, concerning reification and its discontents. So, starting with various irritations that got me going. People often say that philosophy starts in wonder. Rolf Elberfeld has said that Western philosophy starts in wonder, Buddhist philosophy starts from the problem of suffering. Uh, whatever I do here, whether it is philosophy or not, it starts with being irritated by a couple of things. The first thing is brain death. Brain death is a concept, or more precisely an apparatus, because it's an ongoing practice that organizes a large part of social and material reality. It is a, an apparatus that was installed and meant the naturalization of something that is 
crucially existential, namely human death. And the important part and the irritating part for me about this is that it was invented as a response to um, the phenomenon of prolonged deep coma that came about with the progress of medical technology and intensive care units. And it was introduced as the search for scientific criteria to meet existing um, ideas about death. So the initial argument was that when we think about death, uh, when we think about life, we think about people who are responsive, who are active, who can have spontaneous movements and somehow react to the world. So uh, when we show that people who are in a certain state of prolonged deep coma, uh, whose brain is damaged to the extent that they cannot be responsive to the world in any way, it makes sense to say that these people are dead. And then we can do a couple of things, such as explanting organs, uh, such as lungs or the heart, which we couldn't do otherwise, because then we would be killing people who are alive. The problem is that once these scientific criteria were found, um, experience showed that the phenomenon itself did not live up to what it was thought to be. So, you notice that people who had been correctly diagnosed as brain dead did show spontaneous movement. Um, they did show physiological reactions when their relatives entered their rooms, so their heartbeat rate would change, or blood pressure would change, things like that. Uh, and what happened then was not that, as you might expect, the concept of brain death was revoked as wrong, but it was re-explained, and people said that, well, but since all these reactions are not connected to the brain, these people are still dead. So, basically, you first define a set of, nat of naturalistic criteria, so-called scientific criteria, and then after they don't fit the concept anymore, you change the concept. And you make a naturalized concept define the essence of human death. This is what happened and what is still in place today. And for the topic of today, what is important in this process is that the standard response uh, by defenders of brain death to those who have doubts is we are going to explain to you the scientific criteria. So, you run up against experts who show you that from a scientific point of view, in terms of the natural sciences, you just have to accept, and if you don't accept the concept, it means that you didn't understand. You don't possess the correct knowledge. Second irritation uh, in case you haven't noticed immediately, this is on the one side is a human being, Ishiguro Hiroshi, and on the other side is a robot. Uh, I choose this as an image to point to a problem that you could level with the two terms transhumanism or transglobalism. And it is connected to... Um, Something Stephen Hawking recently said when he warned that uh, artificial intelligence may in the end mean the end of the human race or the end of human beings. Which is something that certain people 
in the robotics and artificial intelligence community emphatically embrace and say, uh, who say that if progress goes in the direction um, of the development of an intelligence that is superior to human intelligence, that is the way to go. So it's basically a Darwinistic argument that say if, if they are fitter, then artificial intelligence should survive and um, the humans can go down the drain. Now, what I find irritating about this argument is not simply that somebody thinks that people like myself no longer need to exist, um, which is, I don't know, I don't like it. But um, what I find irritating in the whole framing of the argument is, again, that history is naturalized. So you have this Darwinistic model of history that basically also says there is only one course for history. Uh, and history then becomes a kind of a natural process with a predetermined stages that it simply has to follow. Now, in the face of these two phenomena, it is easy to become a romanticist um, and try to something try something like a return to nature. And obviously, this is an intellectual movement that is very much alive today. Uh, it works with idealized images of nature, mother nature, in Japanese, hahanaru daishizen, you all know these formulas. And in these images of nature's, nature that are then opposed to human society as it is, nature is abstracted from its inhuman and threatening aspects, or these aspects are basically discounted. And again, uh, you are invited or asked to submit to nature, because nature in the end is bigger than us, and it's also more wise than we are. So, there seems to be a strange kind of common ground between the scientist naturalism and the romantic naturalism in taking nature as the ultimate source of legitimacy. Now, in the face of these movements and this common ground, There is a candidate you might want to turn to that presents itself uh, to critique these attitudes, and that would be neo-Marxist critiques, especially in the vein of the Frankfurt School, so Adorno and Horkheimer-like critiques. And indeed, I think that they proposed valid criticisms of the culture industry and its co-optation of romanticism. Uh, they also pointed to the ideological character of Darwinism quite correctly uh, and showed that its basic framework work is in fact very much informed by capitalist economics. So, Darwinism as a Weltanschauung is a mirror image of, again, human society uh, that is naturalized. I think these criticisms, by and large, are valid, but still even in the Frankfurt School texts, uh, for the most part, you will find that the very concept of nature 
is basically being taken for granted. Uh, there is a notable exception, that is Alfred Sohn Retel's work, and I will come back to that. More obviously, um, this is true for traditional Marxism. Uh, what you see here is a Soviet propaganda poster, Sovietskoye znaczy odlicznoye, so uh, Soviet means superior, uh, and you can see the whole imagery behind it. It is a very similar paradigm of overcoming natural limits by science-informed technology. And indeed, traditional Marxism shares this idea that science, the natural sciences, um, are the most important way by which human beings will realize uh, their destiny. It is very instructive, by the way, to read about the introduction of nuclear power to Japan and the role that a couple of Marxist scientists like Taketani Mitsuo played in that process and in his statements you can see precisely this Weltanschauung um, with the idea that by way of science and technology um, humans will take charge of their destiny and create a new and better nature for themselves. Now, to be fair, in recent decades we have seen the development of ecological Marxism, uh, which has pointed to the intrinsic links between capitalism capitalist modes of production and the destruction and exploitation of nature. But even there, the very concept of nature remains mostly unquestioned. unquestioned and with ecological Marxists, as well as with many other ecologists, you find, you can find a penchant for romantic idealization of nature and a kind of static opposition between nature and culture remaining in place. So, what I was looking for, being irritated on these four occasions, uh, what I was looking for was intellectual tools that would help me find a true criticism of scientific naturalism and romanticism, or to say it in other words, tools that would help us to understand nature as a concept that evolved historically and how this concept of nature that we see, dominate uh, the intellectual landscape today, how this concept of nature is tied to the social conditions that we live in. And this is the point where I will briefly go back to Alfred Sohn Rethel, a member of the Frankfurt School. Um, his project was very much the one that I just sketched out. And he tried to do that by deducting the Kantian categories, so the can categories that are fundamental for the development of classical modern science, 
He tried to deduct these categories from capitalist commodity exchange. And I won't go into details here. Um, the only thing that I'm going to say is that it's worth reading, but I think it ultimately it fails both on historical accounts, but also on a logical count. And if you want to know more about that, I would like to point you to an author who is called Anselm Jappe, and who has recently published in Historical Materialism on the Problems of Sonretl's Position. Luckily enough, there were two Japanese theorists that I found helpful in my ongoing thought process, and they are the object of the next part of my talk. Um, I am talking about Hiromatsu Wataru and Maki Yusuke. Hiromatsu Wataru, um, you may have heard um, Professor Katsumori's talk about his idea of a fourfold structure is an important post-war Japanese philosopher, theorist, and also a Marxist. In his book, Busho Karun no Kozo, he follows the development of Marx and Engels thinking and theorizes that there was a major shift from a theory of alienation, which was a kind of romantic humanism, to a theory of reification. He also pointed out that Marx and Engels already were aware that the nature that we see around us is the result of a historical evolution um, and that means that it is infused and informed by human culture and society. So there is no simple opposition between nature and culture on the object side of things. Hiromatsu also posited that you can already find in Marx and Engels a historical critique of the concept of nature as it is developed in science and the basic ideas to interpret nature as the result of a process of reification. And I will come back to these ideas shortly. Maki Yusuke in Gendai Shakai no Zonritsu Kozo the existence structure of contemporary society and developed a three-phase theory of reification where he showed that essential parts of capitalist relations of production work as a social mechanism to engender and enforce the reification of nature and the naturalization of the human realm. And in Jikan no Hikaku Shakai Gaku, he gave more details on that process as far as the concept of time and the social practices of temporal regulations are concerned. So, to say a little bit more about Hiromatsu. Hiromatsu, in a first part of his argument, shows how Marx and Engels arrived already at the conclusion that the nature that surrounds us is inexorably shaped by human productive activity. What you see here is a rainbow over Zurich, seen from the balcony of my flat. Uh, and you see trees, you see in the background a mountain that is green and has trees on it, so nature. Uh, but all of that nature is basically planted by human beings. So it's a product 
of human culture. And you could argue that this rainbow that owes itself to weather, unusual weather conditions in November is also a product of human activity with climate change already taking effect. Maybe, maybe not. We can witness climate change already in Zurich in the past years. Whether it influenced that rainbow, I don't know. Going from the object side to the concept side, as I mentioned already, Hiromatsu argued that the concept of nature is the result of a process of reification. And he gives a very precise definition of reification uh, that I summarize on this slide. He says that reification is a process by which what we know upon reflection to be the result of a social process of object and subject formation appears to the immediate consciousness involved as a primordially given object, a thing in itself. And so nature as the result of reification is just one case in, of many in which reification takes place. And as in all cases of reification, it is basically something that is the result of the isolation of one part of the fourfold structure that Hiromatsu thinks is fundamental for human relations and knowledge of the world uh, from the other parts. So, he would argue that within the reflective process we can know and we indeed ought to know that whenever we encounter an object in nature, we encounter this object as the result of a formative process in which we have created a structure uh, that makes the object appear as such. Uh, by a distinct form of subject formation, and object formation. So, in the case of nature, this process involves the selection of perceptual elements and modes of cognition that, uh, on the basis of a criterion that they can sh be shared by every subject independent of its preferences and individual perspectives. Um, and it's a process of object formation by which the perceptual data are derived of their evaluative elements in order to consolidate an object that is a thing in itself without any meaning. Hiromatsu goes back to Heidegger's distinction of Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit, uh, things at hand, and what is the English term for Vorhandenheit? Ready to hand, present Ready to hand and present at hand. Thank you. Um, to say that On a, in terms of phenomenological reflection, nature is a secondary mode of object building because it's the result of an um, abstraction from uh, things that appear as ready to hand.
So, taking nature or their natural objects as primary objects means to simply isolate these results of subject and object formation um, on the object side and take them as so many givens, given objects, and proceed from there. Hiromatsu concedes that for specific human, social, and cultural purposes, such a reification may be legitimate and even necessary. And that, I think, is an important point to which I will come back in the last part of my talk. He also states that reification is a general process that takes place in human culture. It is not specific for, for capitalist relations of production. And in this sense, he gives a general epistemological critique of reifications. He explains some aspects of its workings in the case of nature. He points to the restricted legitimacy of reification, but what he does not do is to specifically link present-day notions of nature to present-day social conditions and the actual modes of uh, scientific knowledge and social modes of the use of technology that engender these concepts and make them into a social reality to be reckoned with. So to summarize, Hiromatsu helps us to understand that nature as an object is not its simple opposition to culture, but it is infused and transformed by human culture. Secondly, nature as a concept is the result of reification, which involves both subject and object formation. And he calls for a critical awareness so of that fact, so that nature would not be hypostasized as a primary reality. But as I said, Hiromatsu does not explore specific links of modern concept of nature with capitalism and the workings of modern society. This, however, is precisely what Maki Yusuke does in his um, Gendai Shakai no Sonmeritsu Kozo. Through a close reading of Capital, Marx's Capital, he follows three phases of reification that are engendered in capitalist relations of production. So first he argues that commodity exchange involves the reification of social relations. That is the famous Marxian argument of commodity fetishism, which basically says that uh, through commodity exchange, social relations of necessity appear in the shape of things, Not most notably money. So within a commodity producing and exchanging commo uh, economy, human beings are forced to relate to each other in a mode that is a relation to things, a relation to money and other logics of objects and things. 
So that is the first phase, commodity exchange. The second phase concerns the operation of capital as an automatic subject. So within capitalist modes of production, production is organized through investment that has the aim of realizing surplus value. So basically, there is an imperative to use capital to create more capital. And that is the dominant imperative in capitalist production. Investment, production, circulation and distribution are all dominated by this imperative to realize surplus value, which takes precedence over human needs, human insights, better knowledge, and so on. And that is why Marx, in a caricature of the notion of an autonomous subject, talks about capital as the automatic subject. The third phase concerns the organization of production, circulation and distribution that takes place in capitalist economy in which production itself is reified and naturalized on the outward side of things. Uh, this materializes in the automatization of production but it also concerns the naturalization and reification of human needs. So that production is oriented towards the implementation of objective criteria ultimately economic efficiency and the realization of surplus value and within that logic you find other subordinate reified logics concerning technology, the domination of things and machines around which then the life in the factories and production places is organized. On the social side of things, Marquis says, capitalist relations of production lead to the establishment of a middle class, which forms the upper stratum of the proletarians. And the middle class are what in classic Marxian parlance would be the organic intellectuals, who take charge of the various aspects of reified production, circulation, and Reproduction. So the engineers, the traders, the technicians, the managers, but also the journalists, the writers, the philosophers even, who explain the reified logic that everybody has to follow in this process. And in this social reorganization, the spirit or geist is separated from the material agents, from the people who are actually handling the process, who are reduced to consumers or subordinates in the working process. So, the middle class, the people who explore, learn, study the various reified logics, are proletarians, but without knowing it, uh, which makes them prone to various modes of false consciousness, 
um, as I will explain again later. What is important for our subject here is that the opposition of the mental and meaningful and nature is part of this whole process and it is realized in the organization of this process itself. So it is a social reality. It is not just a figment of the mind. So to sum up, Maki analyzes capitalist relations of production as a structure whose dynamic entails a relentless process of naturalization, in which productive activity is turned into managed labor, a process that we all experience right now at universities and so we are now getting first-hand experience of what it means to be managed increasingly. Labor which is reckoned with by an abstract and quantified input of human energy and time that is measured against an equally abstracted and quantified output and which can, in principle, be replaced by automatons of all kinds. On the social side, social relations are mediated by money and subject, again, to calculations. So, in that sense, they are patterned in a similar way um, as uh, the relations within nature are perceived and calculated. Needs, human needs are likewise abstracted and homogenized and quantified and tools are transformed into automatons that to their users become ends in themselves and impose their own logic on human behavior. For every aspect of this process, there are groups of specialists who explore and oversee their optimal manipulation, and these groups can be seen as the subjective agents of naturalization. So everyday life, is governed by practices and imperatives that maintain and enforce the logic of naturalization. Or, to say it differently, survival and success in capitalist society depend on submission to this logic. Now I find the strength of this argument of Maki to lie in the fact that he has no need to argue that scientific concepts of nature actually originate with capitalist relations of production or to deduce them from the process of commodity exchange like Zon Rietl did. Because what he describes is a mechanism of translation and transformation by which these quantified logics become part of everyday life and are and submission to this logic becomes a necessity for all members of society. Now you might ask how is this different from the romantic critique of civilization? I would say it is different on the one hand because it is an analysis of social relations and modes of survival which prevents a quasi-religious appeal to subjective change of heart. It is obvious that a change of heart in individuals is no solution 
if uh, this logic of social operation is in place. And secondly, I believe Maki shows us that the romantic reaction is actually part of the whole picture. And to illustrate that point, I will go more into detail uh, into an analysis of the transformation of needs as use values and um, how it is related to the idolatry of nature through looking more closely at value theory. So now we are in the 10 part, so we are getting closer to the end. <laughs> to very briefly remind you, uh, we all do this every day, the capitalist process of circulation and distribution works in that way. You sell one commodity, the commodity that most of us usually sell is labor. Uh, you receive money and you use that money to buy other commodities such as housing, food, clothing and other things. In this process, there are two sides of value. You buy commodities because of their use value. So you make a subjective judgment that because of the natural properties of what you are buying, uh, it will be useful to satisfy some of your needs. And so the use value is determined by the natural properties of the commodity and by your subjective needs and preferences. The commodity is exchanged through a mediation with exchange value, which is monetarized value. Uh, and the measure of value, as Marx said, is abstract labor, which is in itself measured through socially necessary labor time. And the amount of social necessary labor time that goes into the production of a commodity again depends on social and technological condition, which is why the producers of commodity have a great incentive to explore the natural properties of these commodities um, and find ways, technological ways, to make production more efficient because that is a way to realize extra profit and to survive in a competitive economic environment. So, exchange value is strongly linked to the quantitative exploration of nature, and it is also the side where the abstraction entailed in the capitalist modes of production or relations of production is most obvious. So, especially the face of exchange value, that is money, has always been the most obvious object of critique. Money is the leveler of qualitative differences, um, especially when money is used to uh, create interest. Uh, there is no obvious use value. Uh, there may be profits without production, and so um, this is the side of value that is uh, most often critiqued and calls up utopian and reactionary critiques that actually 
retain or even elevate the production of use values and combine that with polemics against the monetarized economy and especially the finance industry. As you all know, there is a strong historical link of uh, this kind of criticism to anti-Semitism because the Jews are taking to personify, again, money, which is the face of exchange value. Um, and there is a plethora of these kind of abstract pseudo-solutions that try to reform the mode of production and um, social interaction by a reform of circulation and distribution. So the idea is once we can get rid of money, uh, we have solved all the problems. Um, the problem is that these kinds of solutions, again, involve a massive amount of abstraction, they separate circulation and distribution from production, they appeal to consciousness and attitudes without reflecting necessarily on the conditions of survival, uh, and they create a fetish of use value production of which creative nature then becomes a tangible image. So, it is important to remember that use value is one element of capitalist relations of production. A side note, the essential use value in capitalism is the use value for capital, which is surplus value. So capital is used to create more capital, and that is what keeps the whole process going. For the labor side, which is also the consumer side, um, use value is that which represents like the concrete side, the useful side of things. And in many positions that hark back to romantic ideas, this side is reified. But we need to keep in mind that use value in capitalist relations of production in itself is, as Maki has said, reified for the market. Individual needs are analyzed as instances of general and abstract needs. Abstract needs, they are answered by commodities, they are manipulated by experts in marketing and so forth. The development of the market drives the exploration of nature for new uses and use values. Um, so the search for extra profit and the race for innovation drives the exploration of the creative, useful side of nature. And in, in fact, Marx and Engels already spoke of a ruse of capitalism that presents science as pure knowledge, the, the cultural um, realization of the quest for pure, pure knowledge, while indeed it uses science to explore the useful side of nature. And this exploration of objective properties and technological uses goes hand in hand with the exploration of subjective and experiential qualities, which um, 
is also undertaken in art, literature and the media, and where nature can then appear as the pristine realm which is free from lower material needs. Uh, it is a space of recreation by the same token because by being in nature you're outside of um, the threat mill of capitalist surplus production. The point is that especially when exchange value is disregarded in this conceptualization of nature, this nature is then paradoxically linked to commodification. Because the recreational use value grows with the abstraction from material, real-life interests. So the romantic critique and reaction against quantification and exploitation of nature creates, in a way, a holiday consciousness that lends itself to exploitation both commercially and ideologically. To sum up, Capitalist relations of production in, its, in their essence are geared toward the creation of surplus value and they function as an ideological machine that produces and sustains divergent reifications of nature. These may clash on an abstract and theoretical level, but they complement each other on the practical level in protecting and even fostering the capitalist exploitation of both humans and nature. And with this, I come to some qualifications. The picture here is from a village in Colombia. It's called Las Gaviotas. Uh, it was founded in uh, a semi-desert in Colombia by a couple of engineers that wanted to try out a new mode of production and, indeed, social relations as well. And what you see is um, their little factory they have for pine resin production. So they use machines. Um, what you see on the upper right is a forest that they planted in the desert. Um, they managed to um, read grow the de this semi-desert green again to create a large forest there indeed. And under the pine trees, uh, uh, rainforest is slowly growing again. I want to use this picture to remind us that there is a certain danger in simply criticizing reification. Uh, whatever these people do there, on a technological level, is only possible because they use certain modes of reification. Uh, so with this I come back to Hiramatsu's point, who said that reification is a normal part of higher order symbolic mediation, and indeed it may be a necessary prerequisite for uh, its further development. And we need to keep that in mind while also being aware that reification becomes problematic when it is ontologized, when the project of reification is posited as a primordial, primordial being um, and then used as the basis for whatever Weltanschauung you built on that. So one important task of critique is to keep the path of reversal open 
wherever reification is concerned, to allow the de- and reconstruction of reified objects on all levels, on the theoretical side. And it is here where philosophical critique is both necessary and also sufficient. However, where reification becomes part of a social process and fabric, the mere intellectual critique is still necessary, but it is insufficient. One cannot simply call for a change of heart or change of minds. So, we need to understand how and why the science and technology we have today is a science of exploitation and destruction, um, and that is especially true for the so-called high um, or advanced uh, science and technology that um, that attracts the most financial resources. And we need to understand how modern spiritual and artistic culture, including counterculture, in reifying use value, becomes, or lends itself to co-optation uh, in the process of exploitation. And once we've understood that, we need to explore new modes of social cooperation and survival with new standards of art and excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, first of all. Uh, I find it very uh, illustrating and, and also very interesting, the whole project of an archaeology of the evolution of uh, the concept of nature, um, relying on uh, Hiromatsu Watsaru, Maki Yusuke, and Marx. Um, I think this, this goes in the direction of what you could call a real historical materialism, um, in the sense of, uh, as you said, uncovering the, the ideology of nature. Uh, but I wanted to friendly challenge this because um, I wonder whether it falls too short or not. Um, I mean, uh, uh, even if we appropriate or capitalism uh, appropriates nature, in a sense, uh, the conditions of this appropriation uh, are not set by us, in a sense, uh, are, are given, so to speak. So, so to speak, natural, are natural in a sense. We have to adapt to them in order to, in order to control nature. And there even are uh, some phenomena which uh, show that nature actually goes beyond our control uh, in, in some uh, cases and uh, even has its own dynamisms. Uh, for instance, the, the example you said about the rainbow, it may well be the case that the rainbow is a consequence of climate change, but it may be an unwanted consequence. And think, for instance, of the, I don't know, maybe a stupid example, but the Titanic. Uh, they said not even God could uh, make it sink, but something as uh, material and as non-human as an iceberg uh, made it sink. Uh, so in a sense, is as if nature had its, its, its own uh, dynamism. As an alternative, maybe, and also in the realm of materialism, I think we could maybe, uh, as a proposal, follow what at least some uh, ecological Marxists do, and may, that may be something like coming up with a concept of nature which allows us to use the, these dynamisms of nature um, to fight uh, oppression and inequality. Maybe uh, that could go in the direction. Of course, this doesn't mean that uh, we could do this archaeology and, and uh, reify uh, the idea of nature, but um, critique generally has the, the effect that, uh, okay, we relativize what uh, ideology tells us it's objective and given, etc. But uh, then uh, the next step, the, the step, the step which moves us towards uh, fighting inequality is still not uh, taken. Thank you. Um, I perceive what you say as part of what I would think are complementary processes. So, 
we need to have the critique, um, and especially the critique of previous critiques of nature, uh, in order not to fall into the same trap all over again. And that is why I think um, Hiromatsu's remarks on reification in a way as a necessary part of human culture are very important to take into account. Um, now, surely, I mean, I ended on with this picture and this note because I completely agree that it, it is a very important task to develop new modes of negotiating nature and society. Uh, both on the conceptual side and on the ob object side, and I think these need to go together. And for me, this also means that we redefine what, for example, scientific progress or technological pro progress means. Um, and that would mean to then also go in a different direction in the creation of technologies for new social uses. So, the one cannot happen without the other, I would say. Uh, and both sides need to happen. Uh, first, I want to thank you for um, showing the relevance of philosophy to people who aren't philosophers. And I hope that you'll be able to present this work to um, the wider public and show that public philosophy has a role to play. Um, and, and then I think one of the things that you're struggling with perhaps is um, what is problematized is uh, the, the many senses of nature and of naturalization. So in your talk, there seem to be several senses uh, of nature, and I'm trying to get clear on them. So first of all, there's the nature of the natural sciences and the naturalization there. So for the natural sciences, basically, nature is all there is. Nature is all there is, uh, all there really is. And the best way to find out what there really is is through natural empirical scientific investigation. Um, and then, secondly, sometimes you seem to appeal to uh, a kind of romantic sense of nature, uh, especially in, say, citing Hiromatsu, who regards uh, the reification of nature as um, our illusion that when we look at natural things, we're really seeing things that uh, are created, at least in part, by human activity. Uh, when we see the, the trees, it's the trees we've planted. When we see the rainbow, appreciate the rainbow. It's the rainbow that's been brought about by uh, human activities affecting climate change. This assumes a sense of nature that is somehow then, uh, that divides the human and the natural. Um, so of course, there are worldviews that don't so divide the human and the natural. Uh, so at worst, those kinds of worldviews would, would um, I suppose, call what we are calling, what you're calling the reification of nature, they would just say, this is, something, this is part of the natural process of things. Uh, that might not be so good because it allows no, for no sense of uh, exploitation of nature. At, at best, though, then it would say that what we're calling the reification of nature is also the reification of human beings, because there's no fundamental division there. Um, so that seems to be at, at play, too. Now, you might say that the, uh, the, the worldviews that don't divide the human and the nature are going extinct today because of global capitalism or for whatever reason. So that might be the case. But at least historically, we might, have, we might want to look at that. And thirdly, um, when we speak of the reification of nature, kind of means we make of nature a thing, 
So what is nature such that it could be reified? Uh, is it something that is alive? Or, or what exactly is it such that it could be reified? So that seems to be a kind of third, perhaps overlapping sense of nature that's involved in your analysis. Yes, thank you very much um, for making clear a couple of distinctions that I didn't make as clear as I wanted to make them. Um, so, the reason why I went back to the two sides of value slide is that, yes indeed, um, we, I spoke about like the quantified scientific uh, concept of nature as a set of quantifiable, measurable relations, um, and that becomes the basis for a realist argument that says that's all that there really is. Um, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to point out that this is strongly tied to the exchange value side of uh, capitalist relations of production where a, the same process happens. Everything is quantified and basically the quantitative measure is all that really counts. Uh, while the other um, romantic view of nature uh, stands on the use value side. And then there is the, the comprehensive um, extrapolation of nature as the totality of everything, so um, even comprising capitalist relations of production, that's also a mode of operation of nature in this third concept, um, where I would say, well, you can, of course, say that. You can just replace rea the concept of reality with nature. And then, by the very definition, everything is natural. So, capitalism is also natural. Uh, but then the problem is that nature is not a concept that you can use to make critical distinctions between... Um, especially between what humans can choose to make different and what they probably cannot choose to make different. So, I cannot, if I let go of this, I cannot choose to make it not fall. It will fall. Um, but we can choose to live, not individually, but collectively, we can choose to search for a different mode of life of living on this planet. And if we don't do that, as Stephen Hawking said, we will have to leave this planet or become extinct. Um, so I think it is important not to naturalize, especially science and technology and human society, in order to be conceptually able to think about alternative ways to shape our future. But thank you very much for your comments. It's you. Yeah. You're next. Thank you very much for your impressive uh, talk. And I, I'm not sure whether I have um, understood fully. So I might have, I might uh, make, make some like uh, non-related uh, question or comment. But I just want you to ask uh, or rather to say that uh, your your word, the term use la use value might be too wide. I mean, uh, um, I understand your motivation and I, I, I understand your irritation for failure of romantic crit critics and also irritation for failure of Marxism. But uh, um, when we look at the problem of the capitalist, capitalism today, the 
the problem, one of the biggest problem is that um, we are not really looking for uh, looking at the um, natural property of the things itself, but we are rather buying the image of the things. Like we buy, uh, if we buy a new car, even we even we have a, a car, and also we buy a new cloth, even we we have a cloth to wear. That's because um, the the advertisement system is get making things as old and making the things as new things, and uh, this is really a problem of say subjective preferences, but it's not really um, uh, kind of um, one individual's preference, but it's kind of controlled by say, say market. And uh, we are not really looking at natural properties of the things, commodities itself. And that is really a big problem for the capitalism nowadays. So if we look at the, uh, if we look at this program only by this use value and exchange value, we might miss some um, like the fundamental problem. Uh, if, I, I'm sorry if I understand your discussion. No, thank you very much. Um, If I understand you correctly, you are saying that one of the big problems that we face today is that the use values, I use my language now, the use values that drive us to, um, to buy a lot of commodities um, are basically subjective preferences that themselves are the result of manipulation by the marketing industry, right? So, if we were to look at natural properties of the objects that we're buying, we could live with our old mobile phones for a couple of more years, but because it's so attractive, uh, it's made so attractive to have the newest iPhone, we buy it, although it is not really more useful than the old one. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, and also I, I, I will just want to ask that our, uh, we need to follow this um, like rapid, rapid change because our social relationship is also rapidly changing. And yeah, we can you know, uh, live with uh, this old mom and also we can try to stay in the old, old way, old, old, way you know, old style of life. But uh, because the social relationship is the reason of our life, it's also changing. So if you don't follow this uh, change, you are going to be excluded from the society. Yes, so... Um I would say that... If you keep in mind that use value in this whole relationship thing is the product, mainly the product of these natural pro properties factorized by subjective preferences. Um, and this is just one side of a totality. Uh, if you keep in mind what Maki said about the production of needs, um, the reified production of needs, um, then what you are aiming at is precisely, I guess, the gist of Maki's critique. Um, and why I think it is important to label this under the term of use value is because then you see it as part of the whole structure of capitalist value production, which prevents you from thinking, if only we had pure use value, if only we were, you know, if we only had a change of heart, 
if we only would be modest enough to stick with our old mobile phones instead of buying a new one every year. Uh, that is an attitude that kind of um, isolates one part of the use value uh, as if that was not part of the structural totality. Um, and that, I think, prevents, um, that, that leads to strategies uh, that are simply not realistic and viable. So you, you produce a lot of anxiety and uh, bad consciousness, um, remorse among consumers without really changing anything. Um, which is why I, I would argue that I am aware that I, you know, I put a lot on the use value side, but I think this is indeed necessary to be aware uh, of the fact that this is really a part of a larger thing. Right. Now I understand and yeah, agree with you. It's really inseparable, the, the elements you have placed under the yes. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a very disturbing problem, nature because we are really witnessing some unbelievable things, you know that. Uh, I wanted to bring into this discussion nature, we, I mean the medieval definition was something like na natura la trans, and natura la data, and so forth, and somehow we forget nature is also destructive, nature destroys, all human activities in two minutes, right? With the tsunami and earthquake, my aunt lost everything in two minutes. And there is everything. And stuff like that. And somehow I think in this kind of discourse, we need to bring in that aspect in which nature is not only um, kind and nurturing, but it can also make us kind of realize and then the hubris comes in, human. We are always gambling as to how far we can go to the coast to farm and then maybe another hundred years we can you know, plant and then you know, we have to begin again. Okay, so I think things are changing today in our consciousness at least uh, how to define nature, how to talk about it and how to talk about human responsibility and place in that because I think I think one of the things philosophy, it may be also Japanese philosophy, needs to address is this co-presence, co-existence with nature, but also this unbelievable power that nature has. So in Japanese we can say shizen and dai shizen. Immediately there is something different. Shizen, we might manipulate. Dai Shizen, we cannot. And a lot of animals are based, you know, made on that, like uh, Miyazaki Hayao stuff. I think he's tried to send us some message. So, uh, and I didn't take one of the things very seriously until the very last scene. Exactly reminded me of what happened, you know, in. When, how, how was it? 2011 or 12? Yes, 3 Wakanda. After that, I watched it again. That, uh, opposite Princess Mononoke. Mm -hmm. And then I said, oh my gosh. <coughs> because there is a kind of uh, image that we know, we understand. And so, in this kind of very beautiful um, analysis, I think we need to bring in something more, like a crisis. You know, I think that's why you are irritated. Because I think we are all aware that what we are doing is not is crazy out of sync, so to speak. And and I agree with you that, that if somehow if we naturalize things, then we that's the biggest legitimization we can and human activities are legitimized if it's natural. And now, um, how do we 
understand destruction, the destructive power of nature. So this is just my little kind of um, question, and how do we build uh, thinking? Yes. Um, again, I completely agree, and one of the reasons that um, motivated me to embark on this project is that I think this static distinction between nature and culture, technology, civilization that forms the basis of classic modern discourse um, overlooks the fact that whenever we create a technology and we, put, we produce it, obviously it becomes a part of nature. Uh, and when we create massive technologies like nuclear power, we create Daishizen. Oh yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. That is, I mean, you may disagree, but that is, well, there's one important thing that I wanted to say today, is we need to be aware that technology um, becomes, once it's produced, it becomes a part of nature in precisely this sense. It is something that we cannot completely control, and it might come back to us like a thunderstorm, like a tsunami, um, because the very fact that it has been produced has made it a part of nature. Um, and with everything that entails. So, yes. <laughs> um, yes, it is important to keep the destructive side of what we call nature always in mind. Thank you.